On today's episode of The Happy House, we're learning how to freeze family meals with our family meal planning expert, Alice Seufert. And then, you won't believe how easy it is to give this chair a fresh look. Finally, I'm with Christopher Straub, fashion designer and stylist, and we're learning about his latest project. Stay tuned for The Happy House. I'm here today with our family food expert, Alice Seufert, and she is going to talk to us about freezer meals, which I love because I have four kids and it's and I work full time, so it's hard to always come home and make a meal. So, But a lot of times I make things and I freeze them and they don't turn out right or they look bad or I don't even know what they are. I don't know what they are. So yes. talk to me about this. So I'm going to show you today how to keep your meals frozen but not frosty. Um, the first thing we're going to do and the first step for everyone at home when you're thinking about freezer meals is get your freezer organized. Okay. So when you're at home, do an inventory, see what you have, make sure it's labeled. Uh, make sure there's nothing mysterious. So I so, pulled these out of my freezer at home. Are you this are is, you being shamed a little bit right now? Because we don't know. I'm just being is. honest. <laughs> I want I want you to know freezing meals is easy, but you have to do it right. right. Okay, so I I pulled these two things out, and what are they? I don't know. I have had that. I, I often defrost what I think is um, meat sauce or spaghetti sauce, and it's soup with kale, and my kids are like, uh-uh. Yeah. So, I know. I was yeah. looking at this, and I'm like, I think it might be soup. It could be like gravy with meat bits in it. This might be, it might be spaghetti sauce. But we don't I'm know. not sure. Yeah. So okay. I think when you're doing your organization as your first step, you want to throw out anything that you're doubtful about, anything that you just don't know, or defrost. And, see and what have it all is the neighbors and over and just be like, "Come eat! It's mystery! It's mystery it's meal night at the Olsen freezer yes. potluck." Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. So that's what I would say is the first step. So um, what I do at home, I keep like an Excel spreadsheet or even just like go out to my freezer with a notebook. Excel spreadsheet. Yes. Because I actually, yes. I think you're going to talk to me about something that's going to be easier yeah. for me than an Excel spreadsheet. So if you if you're really really into organizing, yeah. go spreadsheet. Yeah. Otherwise, just keep a piece of notebook paper, or regular paper on your fridge. If you have an outdoor freezer, keep it inside, whatever. Then you kind of know, like I organize it by category. So what do I have like in meat category? What do I have for veggies? What do I have that are already fully cooked meals? I think it's really important because I am a um, grocery store shopper, but I am also a warehouse shopper. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times, I don't know how much meat I have and then I yep. will buy it and go to put it away and I'm like, I actually had this already. So that's... Yep. And organizing your freezer or your pantry is basically the first step in really great meal planning for okay. your family because you can say, you can look at your list and say, oh, I have, you know, four hamburger patties or I have, um, you know, a chicken in there or whatever you have and then you can kind of plan your meal around that. So let's talk about these things that are actually very well labeled and like what freezes well, what doesn't freeze well. Mm -hmm. Help me kind of navigate this for my family. I think what's great about freezing is you can do it year round. So you can freeze things in the summer. So um, the first thing I'll show you is I have, um, I may make blueberry wild rice burgers. That's actually amazing. Can <laughs> I have one today? No, they're raw. <laughs> they're frozen. <laughs> okay. Um, you love having burgers in the summer, right? Yes. So make a huge batch, make a double batch of whatever your favorite burger recipe is. Don't make the mistake of making all these patties, sticking them in a bag, unless they're wrapped in parchment paper. I love that. So parchment paper, yes. I use it for baking all the time, mm -hmm. but I hadn't really thought about the fact that it's basically, you can cut little squares of it and put your burgers exactly. in there, which is what I'm seeing right here. Yeah. It's, um, I think that's really great because then you can just take out one. It, it, we've got this really big bag here, mm -hmm. but like let's just say my husband and my son are home and they want to grill up a couple of burgers. They could then just take two out of here and not have to separate them or not have this big chunk yeah. of meat, right? Exactly. So parchment paper is great and as an alternative. A lot of people use tin foil, for example, to do freezing. And I like parchment because 
because a lot of times, like especially with burgers, you're defrosting it, you just peel it right off. But the other great thing about parchment is when you wanna actually think about the process of like, how are you making this meal for your family? So for me, I'm gonna defrost something and then I'm likely gonna microwave it. So okay. you can't microwave tin foil. No. So, but parchment- And it doesn't peel right exactly, off. Exactly, we'll parchment just... actually peels off. It makes it really easy. So on the back end of when you're thinking about making this for your family, it's a lot faster of a process. Perfect. Okay, so let's talk about what is this? What is this? So that is tomato soup. But if you can see, if it didn't have a label, you'd probably go, why is there corn? What or is what's it? the what are the mysterious ingredients? So I always say, so when I make a soup, I lay it flat, I put it on a cookie sheet, and then I put it in my freezer and it freezes flat. So you see how it's like starting yes. to freeze now. So that's how you can store it so that it's easy in the freezer. You can store like multiple soups. And then um, I double bag it. So you see that I have it in a gallon bag. Yes. So one of my other favorite supplies is a, is a two gallon bag. And you can either get those with the zip top or the slider. Okay. But this is important because what, again, on the back end when you're thinking about how are you gonna serve this to your family, you're gonna stick the soup in your fridge and let it defrost. Yes, in and the morning before you yeah. go to work. And yep. sometimes you're gonna get condensation. It's gonna get a little drippy so I always say stick it in another gallon bag and then I stick it in like a bowl or something to let it defrost. That's actually a really important tip. Mm -hmm. I, I love that. I typically stick my things in a bowl when I defrost in the fridge but having this bag would mm -hmm. be really nice. You don't have to do that. You mm -hmm. can just throw it in the fridge then. Exactly and that's exactly what I do because otherwise I mean if you take a frozen item out of your out of your freezer at 530 I mean it's going to take 20-25 minutes to cook in the microwave right. let alone the oven to defrost. And so. then you're rushing it too exactly. like the whole yep. elevator a lot of times time, like so. the beginning of the week we'll go out to the freezer and just pick a few things that we want to have for the week and then get some containers to let it defrost in the fridge for the week and then we just are eating meals through perfect, those frozen meals a week. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, so the, so yeah. Then. So the, let's talk about casseroles and deep dish dishes like lasagna. Okay. So um, when you're freezing something like a casserole and you're making it in a big dish, the worst thing you can do is just take that big dish and freeze it because likely for your family, you're only gonna to wanna to have a couple of portions. You're not gonna to wanna to eat, for example, green bean casserole every night, but it's nice to have it like six months after Thanksgiving yes. and have a little I bit. I love green bean casserole. Plus, I mean, like we just talked about before, it, it takes so long then mm -hmm. to cook the whole thing. So right. then you're, you've cooked it and then you're recooking it mm -hmm. again and then you're gonna throw it away. So right. if you cut it up into bite-sized pieces, mm -hmm. that's the better thing, right? Exactly. So what I did is I just um, froze it in a smaller size. This, so this is like a perfect size portion for four people in my family. Okay. And then we'll actually eat that. Um, this is like, it is a great size. Yeah, exactly. I love how also you say eat, but you have a date on here because I never mm -hmm. do that. So again, mm -hmm. when I pull these mystery machines mm -hmm. out of my freezer, <laughs> I'm like, how long has this been in here? Yes. So yes, okay. a Sharpie is your friend. You're gonna wanna label it. And I say eat by, um, the really cool thing about frozen foods is really there's no sort of expiration of how long something can be frozen. Okay. What you're really looking for is quality and taste. So I always say like, I, I usually go four to six months okay. for most of the stuff that I freeze because I think that's the best quality. That's a and great then tip. you can see like with the lasagna, again, I use the parchment paper. I'm freezing individual okay. size portions versus just throwing one piece in here, which is going to get nice and frosty, yep. not being getting the air out. And this. Thank you for these tips. I'm actually, yeah. I just came away with a ton of tips for freezing food for my family. If you want to learn more about what we have talked about today and actually get Alice's recipe for these blueberry wild rice burgers, visit our website. Don't be afraid to take office supplies into the kitchen. One of my favorite things to use in the kitchen is painter's tape. I use it to label inside my freezer, in my fridge, on Tupperware, and I always have a Sharpie. Coming up next on The Happy House, you won't believe how easy it is to give this chair a fresh look. Are you ready, Ella? Mm-hmm. I'm with Ella today, and we are going to talk about an easy chair redo. Ella, do you remember when I was over for dinner at your house, and your mom showed me these chairs in your living room that had been this way for a really long time? Yeah. Yes. How long have, have these chairs been like this? Like for like 15 to 20 years or something. 15 to 20 years. We it's don't a really old chair. It belonged to my dad's parents, 
but I never got to meet them. Okay, so these are special. They're part of your family, right? Uh -huh. And your mom really wanted to use these chairs, but there was some webbing in here that they had taken out, and she kind of couldn't figure out how to put it back together. And I thought, hey, what we could probably do is measure a board to fit just so, and then cover it with foam and batting to soften out the foam. And then a fabric of our choice, and this actually goes really well with your living room. Do you remember that ottoman you have in there? Yeah. Yeah? So that's gonna match just perfect. And we can actually reupholster this chair. The first step, Ella, was we measured the frame of the chair to come up with the size of the board we needed. I went to my local big box hardware store and just had this cut down and this piece of wood was probably like four dollars. I mean not very expensive at all. So then we've got our support system, right? But what we're going to do is start with all of our layers. So the top layer of this chair is what? Like what do we sit on? Um, uh, fabric? <laughs> Correct. Fabric. I like how you call it fabric and not material. Nux on that. Yep. Okay. This fabric kind of has some stripes to it. And I want the stripes to go front to back, not side to side. So I'm going to lay it down on the ground. And actually, I bought about a yard of this fabric and it was 60% off at my local fabric store. So it ended up probably being about $15 to make two chair covers. Not bad, right? They were each $7.50. Correct. She is not dumb. Okay, the next layer actually is this, what we call batting, and that is going to soften out the foam. So I'm going to lay that on top of our fabric and smooth it out. Then I'm gonna lay down this foam pad which I bought. So I do need to make sure, I went a little narrow on my fabric here, so I do need to make sure I center this exactly in the middle so I have enough room. Then I am going to take, and as I said before, Ella, my chair is a little bit wider than it is deep, so I'm going to make sure I put the wood in the direction I want the stripes of the fabric going. Uh, what we're going to do first is take our fabric, we're gonna make sure we have enough fabric on each side, which I do. It's barely enough, but it's going to be enough. And so we're going to start by doing an initial staple. Look at that. That makes a really loud noise. <laughs> no, it sure does. And then we're gonna do the other staple. A lot of people, when they reupholster things or kind of redo things, it would make sense in their mind that they would start at one side and then kind of go all the way around. But you need to do center opposite sides, center opposite sides, and then begin working out from there to make sure everything is distributed evenly. Do you think your mom will let you use this? No. <laughs> all right, let's finish our stapling project. We've stapled all the way around, but as you can tell, we have all this excess fabric. Can you help me trim it away? Okay. All right, here's the sizzles. These are very sharp, so of course, I'm supervising Ella while we do this project together. Nice work. It's hard to cut upholstery fabric, isn't it? And to swell them at the same time. All right, good job, Ella. Oh, she's got the glide down now. We've trimmed away a lot of extra fabric. We might have some more trimming to do after we're done, but now we're gonna do the corners, and that is my favorite part. Because what we do is we take the corner in, on the corner, and put it in nice and tight. And we staple gun it. And then we staple gun it. Correct. And you only have to do it once. Doesn't and take then forever. you basically do small folds or pleats 
to finish. Okay, at least get this gonna try. Um, yeah, right here. You do small plates right here. Press down, yeah. This is like a don't this is, to tell your mom. Okay. Okay. I'm kidding, I'll tell your mom. But we do small pleats. This is just like a normal staple gum, but huge. I know. To finish off our corners and make a nice rounded edge, just like that. All right, Ella, last staple, and then we're gonna see how this looks. Okay. Okay. Ooh. <gasps> it looks nice. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's gonna fit? Yep. Okay, because I measured. Yeah. All right, let's put this in, and then I want you to try it out and tell me what you think. It's comfy. <laughs> Thank you so much for helping me with this project. Do you think your mom's going to be excited about it? Uh-huh. All right. To learn more about how we did this project and for other fun home projects you can do, visit our website. Up next on The Happy House, I'm with fashion designer and stylist Christopher Straub, and we are learning about his latest project. I'm here today with Christopher Straub, fashion designer and stylist, and you are fantastic at both of those things, but you've got another project that you have cooked up, this amazing little book. Well, thank you, you. How did you come about thinking about writing a book or how this whole thing come to be? Well, it, it's sort of a multi-pronged effort that, that went into this, and, and really it came from, I've always been a fan of manatees forever, since I was a very small child. I just liked that they were kind of the odd one out it's the, they weren't pretty no one was getting tattoos of them like they're not the <laughs> dolphin right everyone right? loves the dolphin the dolphin does the thing and bounces on the nose and it's like everyone loves the dolphin but the manatees are sort of the like they're sort of off to the side and they're a little misunderstood and they're not all that pretty and I sort of I, I love that aspect of you them, gravitated right? towards that yes. exactly okay and so as an artist I've been sort of drawing these and creating these forever but then recently I've been doing a lot more illustrations for other businesses, you know, big businesses, even celebrities, and I haven't been able to really um, put my name on it. And I thought, well, this is the perfect time for me to put my illustrations and my love of manatees together in this book. And tell a really great story, actually. So, spoiler alert, this book is about a manatee who, like you said, doesn't feel understood and is really just trying to find his place, which I think is an amazing message for kids. Mm -hmm. And I also love the amazing backgrounds on every page. How did you do that? So all the backgrounds are photographs, photorealism printing of a photograph that I took of crumpled up paper. And so there's a lot of texture and a lot of depth. If you turn the page, every page is a different color. And so you're at a little different moment in the sea and it really gives some variety and just that another visual impact to the book. All the illustrations are colored just a little bit outside of the lines. I can see that actually right here. It's one of my sort of just calls to that nothing's perfect, nobody's perfect, perfect like imperfect is perfect right and so that just you know really just added to the visual effect of the of the book as well I have to say that my son has this book and he will actually spend a lot of time looking at the texture the background texture and I think just engaging kids in small things but big things I mean really mm -hmm. engaging them to pay attention to things is something that is important and this book really does. I wanted it to feel important and tactile and that's also why I did it in hardcover but on the cover on the front um, you may notice that the the background is matte and then the uh, there's a UV polish finish on the the character and the words and that's another way to give to sort of force perspective and give give depth and another creative aspect to the book. So there's also a little friend that goes with this book our plush guy who we have this Albert and talk to me I actually wouldn't even know how to create a plush animal. I mean, what's mm -hmm. the process of that? Well, I really wanted it to be not just an exact replica of, you know, not the same proportions as the drawing character. I wanted to feel a little more huggable. The proportions are a little more round and um, kind of, you know, easy to, to interact with. But when the hardest thing for me to do was not necessarily the shape and the style, but was the fur. I didn't want this to feel like um, a plush from any store. I wanted it to feel really handcrafted and so I went to my factories and went through all sorts of fabric swatches and 
came up with a couple styles that I liked and I said, make a new one that looks like this but feels like this. And we and we came up with this. This is nowhere else on the planet is my little gray plush it's for this really, manatee. It's really beautiful and it's just the right size, honestly, for a two-year-old or mm -hmm. an eight-year-old as mm -hmm. I have. So I, I just, I love it. Very well done. So you said you've loved manatees your entire life, but I happen to know that this project started a very, very long time mm -hmm. ago with a tiny little manatee. Well, being an artist, I, I uh, for my entire life, I was sculpting manatees as well. And so I have this little manatee that I made probably when I was, I don't know, 15 years old. So over 20 years ago, I was in, I was in high school, I made this little guy and this, I, I discovered this like a couple months ago, after I had published the book. So it isn't it brewing. funny if you look brewing. at them yeah. side by side, it's, you know, it's really the beginnings of this character. I love this story because a lot of times in our lives, we think of something and it's brewing in the back of our mind, but we might not have time or might not be in the space or it needs to just continue to develop. But it's really important to remember that as people, we might do something 15 years, 20 mm -hmm. years later that started when we were younger. And I, I just, I love that about this. Well, and the, it's like the passion was there. Like I knew I wanted to do something like this and put my name on it. So I did all the writing, all the illustrations, and even self-published the book and designed the fabric. Did, like I, it, it's very much a part of me, this it's project. It's a labor of love. So the message in this book is really about Albert finding his place. Did that stem from something personally? What, here's what's so great about the book is that originally when I started writing it, it didn't have a message. And it was really just a factual, you know, like it, it, it tells you facts about a manatee and yes. compares and contrasts him with all of his other animals, uh, animal friends in the sea, right? And then um, when I had it reviewed by another author, they said, oh, I see the message. It's about um, acceptance and, you know, you know, really applicable things with our lives. And I thought, Oh my gosh, that wasn't what I set out to do. It just happened organically. Yeah. And I almost am happier about that than having to have tried to force it or gone out there with the message. So it really is, it does, you can find the message in it. It can just be about facts of this is what a manatee is compared to a dolphin right. or compared to a seal or compared to a pufferfish. But you can also see the message that even though um, we are all different, we have commonalities, and we can find those commonalities in each other. I love it, it's amazing. And as I said, my son responded very positively to this book, so thank you so much for writing thank it. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. To learn more about Christopher's work, visit his website, ChristopherStraub.com, or visit our website. Everyone, we're rolling. Roll, roll, unhappy. Good clap. I'm here with our family food expert, Alice Seifert, and she is going to talk to me about, and us, about planning family meals, freezer meals, honestly, which is such a godsend on it when you are, okay, so Let's start, I was just about to say, let's start again. Turn off the fan and everyone's getting a glare on the counter, on the counter.